We are interrupting programming right now for breaking news. We are getting an update from Governor Roy Cooper. Sources confirmed to Channel 9. He's going to be announcing the closure of all public schools in the state for at least two weeks. Let's listen in. As of this morning, North Carolina has 23 positive results on COVID-19 tests in 12 counties in our state. As you know, we're all changing our ways of life to contain and to limit this disease that has come from this pandemic. Now we need to ask you to change even more. Today, I'm issuing an executive order to stop mass gatherings of more than 100 people across our state. As you know, we issued this as guidance on Thursday. However, Despite this guidance, several venues continued their events. So today's order makes it mandatory. This is a risk we cannot tolerate. No concert is worth the spread of this pandemic. The people of our state are taking this seriously and we need concert promoters and event organizers to do the same. The executive order has another key component. It directs all K through 12 public schools across our state to close for students on Monday, March the 16th for at least two weeks. Several school districts have already made this decision and others are considering closures. Many parents are choosing to keep their children home from school. We need a statewide response and statewide action. I'm here with State Board of Education Chairman Eric Davis, State Superintendent of Public Instruction Mark Johnson, and our Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Mandy Cohen. And we all agree on this order. Closing schools now will give us time for further understanding of COVID-19 and its effects on the people of our state. I do not make this decision lightly. We know that it will be, be difficult on many parents and students. These measures will hurt people whose incomes are affected by the prohibition of mass gatherings, particularly the people who are paid by the hour. These measures will also be tough on working parents and children who get their meals at school. We are working on efforts to deal with these challenges, from changes to unemployment insurance to special funding from the state and federal government to help us get through this. To that end, I've appointed an education and nutrition working group from the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Public Instruction, the State Board of Education, and schools to come up with smart solutions for safe childcare, meal service, and other equity issues. I know at least one district is using school buses to deliver daily meals to children on bus routes, and I commend this innovative thinking. And we are concentrating our efforts on solutions for the children of front, frontline healthcare workers who we know are gonna to need to be at work. Our lives have been turned upside down by this pandemic, but we're gonna get through this. I'm grateful to the people of our state who are doing the right thing and taking steps to protect themselves and their families. Hindsight is 2020. I don't want any regrets in our rearview mirror when this pandemic subsides. I'm guided by a clear goal, doing all we can to keep people from getting sick and to make sure that those who do have excellent care and treatment. With me on stage today, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Mandy Cohen, State Board of Education Chairman Eric Davis, our State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mark Johnson, 
our emergency management director, Mike Sprayberry, and our secretary of the Department of Public Safety, Eric Hooks, which has the Department of Emergency Management under it. And I particularly want to thank Secretary Hooks for his good work and organization here during these past few days. I'd now like to recognize uh, Secretary Cohen for some updates on this order and other issues uh, involved with COVID-19. Secretary Cohen. Thank you, sir. So we've all learned a new term as a result of COVID-19, social distancing. It's why we're prohibiting mass gatherings of 100 people or more. As a reminder, social distancing means staying approximately six feet away from other people whenever possible. Washing your hands, using hand sanitizer, and practicing proper respiratory etiquette, including coughing into an elbow. I also want to echo the governor's remarks that school closings was an incredibly hard and complex decision. School closures have major consequences for families and communities that go beyond this virus. And it's too often those with the least resources that bear the greatest burdens of this decision. To address this, the governor has tasked my department, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of Public Instruction to work together with stakeholders to make sure that our children have enough food to eat, families have options for safe places for their young children, and student learning continues. We are particularly thinking about our health care workers, as the governor mentioned. We know they need child care so they can remain at the front lines of this pandemic. The work group will think innov innovatively about how to support these folks. The work group is going to be chaired by Susan Gale Perry, Chief Deputy Secretary at NCDHHS, and David Stiegel, Deputy State Superintendent of Innovation at the Department of Public Instruction, and they've already begun their work. I want to conclude by reminding everyone that the course of COVID-19 in North Carolina is not determined. As I mentioned the other day, the Director General of the World Health Organization said when declaring COVID-19 as a pandemic, we cannot say this loudly enough or clearly enough or often enough. All countries can still change the course of this pandemic. I'm proud that our governor is making sure that North Carolina is leading the way. Thank you. I'd now like to recognize the Chairman of the State Board of Education, Mr. Eric Davis. Thank you, Governor Cooper. Um, on behalf of my colleagues on the State Board of Education, I'd like to express our appreciation to you for your tireless efforts in this ever-involving situation and also to Secretary Cohen and her team at DHHS and her partnership in caring for our students and teachers and families across North Carolina. I also want to express my concern to parents for their students' safety, health, and continued education, to our teachers and staff for their tireless efforts for our students, and for the extreme pressure that our local superintendents and boards of education have felt during this situation. In response to this difficult decision, the Board of Education commits to take any and all actions necessary for steps to identify and mitigate the impacts of school closures on North Carolina's children and their families, to identify and seek flexibilities in federal and state law and regulations to continue delivery of instruction to students in all ways possible. In addition, we commit our support to public school leaders as they work with local health departments, community leaders, educators, and families. We commit to work with the federal, state, and local authorities to identify and implement options to continue the provision of meal services to our eligible participants. And we commit to coordinate with the Department of Health and Human Services on matters related to early childhood educational services delivered in partnership with public schools. We'll continue to work with the leaders of the North Carolina Community College System, the University of North Carolina System, and the North Carolina Independent Colleges and Universities to ensure the continued per participation of public high school students in dual enrollment courses in post-secondary institutions, including students enrolled in cooperative innovative high schools. Further, the State Board commits to work with leaders in the Department of Public Instruction 
and our superintendent of public instruction, the North Carolina Community College and UNC systems, the executive branch and the legislative branch to identify waivers or temporary adjustments to laws and regulations governing the state's system of public schools in order to address impacts from the present circumstances. And finally, we work to encourage local school leaders to work with health departments, the Department of Health and Human Services, and other public health leaders to coordinate continuity plans concerning facility access and facility use. At this time, I'll turn to my colleague in education, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Superintendent Johnson. I am State Superintendent Mark Johnson, and I want to thank Governor Cooper and his team for our bipartisan efforts over the course of this last week in support of our schools during this very difficult time for our students, for our educators, for parents, and for all of the families of North Carolina. This is the decision that no one wanted to see happen, but it is the right decision. And I thank Governor Cooper for working with us to make this happen. Last week, we began preparing in case we found ourselves in this situation. And we will continue that work with local school districts to make sure that in these trying times ahead, we best meet the needs of our students and of our entire state. Thank you, Governor Cooper. We'll now take questions that you might have. Okay, let's Yeah, the question was, are there going to be efforts to help people who are going to need help as a result of closing by schools and trying to organize volunteers? There's no question that this needs a statewide response and statewide action. We had a lot of school districts that were either closing or considering closing. Lots of anecdotal evidence of parents who were going to keep their kids home from school. And as we know, the man, school, public school is mandatory for, for children. We've tasked this working group to find solutions. And they're going to have the benefit of an emergency declaration that will allow waivers of regulations and restrictions in order to be able to get relief fast to people in a statewide closure and a statewide action plan that makes sure that we do this is important. I think one of the great things that we see in, a times, of, in times of crisis in our state are people who reach out to help others. And I've seen a lot of people, uh, even some people in my family, who are now working from home because they're teleworking and they're offering to uh, look after children of friends. Uh, and encouraging that kind of thing is, is positive. And I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because a lot of that is happening and we hope that that, that kind of thing happens even more. Will there be an effort Absolutely, and that's something that this working group will do. Um, I just had a question about testing. We're still hearing that people are having trouble um, getting tested, even when they have symptoms and have uh, been cleared of having any other kind of virus. Can you tell me how many people have been tested in the state, including in pri by private labs, what the state capacity for testing is, and what are the restrictions on 
testing need to be boosted so that people can be tested if they have symptoms. I mean, if we're not testing everybody who has symptoms, doesn't it undermine the goal of getting people treatment? The question is about testing, and we are doing everything we can to make sure that everybody who should get a test is tested. As you know, we had limited supplies from the CDC that we had been promised. So our health experts went outside of that to work with private contractors. And now there are more and more people online who are providing uh, testing. And we want to work to make sure that happens. But I'm going to recognize Dr. Cohen to give you the latest update. Thank you. As the governor mentioned, we've worked through several barriers. So I think issues that may have been happening earlier in the week are certainly resolved by the end of the week. First, we have changed the criteria. So criteria for getting testing should no longer be a barrier. We did that earlier this week. Criteria for clinicians to use for testing includes fever, a cough, and negative for flu. We've been sharing that information for many days, and we want folks to be tested if they have a fever, cough, or a negative for the flu. Second, North Carolina, like all states, have faced, as the governor said, some limited access to supplies. We've been aggressively working with um, our academic and private partners to do everything possible to increase the amount of testing our state is able to do, and there's been a lot of progress. Um, and we've been seeing an, a great acceleration in the number of folks who are tested. So our situation is better than it was a week ago, but I don't want to say there aren't continued challenges on the horizon for that supply chain, and we continue to work on that. Um, so we continue to put out more guidance for our, um, our clinicians to make sure that they know how folks can get, can get tested, how to access that, as well as we're working on right now the very specific protocols that they can use to make sure that they know how to step through this. Additionally, we're looking at some additional community-based sites where folks can be getting this testing, and we hope to have more information for that, including options for drive-through testing and others in the next coming days. Sure. So first, we are, are, have put out guidance for all clinicians to say that the criteria that we're using for testing um, are folks with fever, with cough, um, and who are testing negative for the flu. And so if someone calls their, their doctor, that's the, that's the first call to make. And if they said their doctor is, is not testing for whatever reason, uh, their capacity is limited at, at their practice. Um, there are a couple of options. Yes, I think the first call should be to your local health department, um, which all of our communities have, and they can either help get you testing at the community, uh, at the public health department, or direct you to other places where testing might be available. This is exactly why we're looking at other community-based alternative sites um, to make sure that folks who feel like they want access to testing, um, that they can get it. What I, would, I want to note about testing, because there's a lot of focus on testing, is that at different phases of what we're experiencing related to the virus, testing is, is important. It's particularly important early on as we work on what is called the containment phase of, of the virus. Um, but understand that testing does not equal treatment. And I think we want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to protect our communities so that folks who need treatment Again, there are no medicines and no vaccines for this virus, but might need access to medical care, supportive medical care, so that they could have it, right? So testing is an important part in the first phase of this work, but again, is not as, doesn't become as important as we move through this. What we're trying to do is preserve our capacity in our medical system to make sure folks have access to the care they need. Testing, is there, 
we, we were just talking about giving you those numbers. So, Dr. Cole. Yeah, so I don't have the numbers in front of us, but we are updating numbers of supply, of, of how much supply we have at our state lab. Obviously, as more and more laboratories become online, they are doing testing. So what we can report is what we are able to do in our state lab. And I think just from the numbers you've seen reported, we have of quite a throughput, maybe as many as 100 tests we ran just yesterday. Um, I think between um, our, ourselves and uh, what we know from just LabCorp, again, that is not the entire state, but our state lab and LabCorp, we've done well over 500 tests um, at this point. Um, and that continues to accelerate as folks need it. And again, we are, are, are at still with, with doing 500 tests at the number we are t today of 23 cases, um, which means that there are still a lot of negative tests um, that folks are coming back with, meaning that they have flu, that I'm sorry, they have fever, they have cough and are negative for the flu, but are still negative for COVID-19. That is a good sign. Um, but we want to be vigilant. We want to make sure, again, we continue to test folks that, that need uh, the test based on that criteria. And that's why we're putting out additional guidance for clinicians and others to make sure they know um, what, what the protocol is. Okay. Hold on. Travis, you, you, you had a question. question. One, have we had a community transmission yet? And then two, what changed on the schools in the last 24 hours or so? Uh, Number one, we have not had community spread as of yet, and that's a good thing. All of the positives so far have been with some direct contact. Secondly, we are seeing increased anxiety, fear from parents, from teachers, from superintendents across our state. We're seeing a patchwork of schools beginning to uh, adjourn, to let out their schools. Uh, we had parents, some parents keeping their kids from school. We need a period of time here to assess the threat of COVID-19 and to make sure we have a coordinated statewide response to deal with the the fallout that comes when you don't have children in school. And we are very aware of those things. And so when you think about the public health of children, if you have one school system that is out and another one that's not, and then another one that lengthens spring break, then you, you, it's hard to have a coordinated response to dealing with the fallout from not having school. And I think, you know, we've, we've consulted people in other states. We see that this period of time to figure out where we are is, is important. As I said earlier, I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, and I think we don't want to be looking in the rearview mirror and regretting not doing this. And I think it's important for the safety, health, and welfare of our state to do it. I think yesterday, and there's really, I'm not sure there's a right or wrong decision here because there's so much we don't know. And I think if we're going to err, we need to err on the side of caution, take this two-week period of time, see where we are with the pandemic in our state and across the world, see what additional data comes to the forefront put our plan in place where we're going to help people who have child care needs and help people who uh, are have trouble with kids getting nutrition and we're we're going to we're going to concentrate on that no the cdc no the cdc guidance has not changed no it has not yes can the the large gathering order does not apply to restaurants or to shopping malls or to other retail stores there is however guidance from the department of health and human services about social distancing about uh, the fact that you do have sort of people in transient and who are walking around in these areas 
So we have not included them in the order, but want people, restaurant owners, and retail establishments to be mindful of the social distancing and to take steps to protect their customers in that way. And Dr. Cohen, if you have something that you want to add to that. Okay. Yes, sir, can you get the mic? I know that uh, the chairman of the school board and the superintendent are working very hard on continued learning, and this working group that we put together is going to concentrate on doing everything we can to make sure that children can continue to learn. And Chairman Davis, if you want to talk about what you guys are doing, you can, or Superintendent Johnson, either, either one of you all. On Friday, we already had a large convening of superintendents and their chief technology officers and chief academic officers over a webinar where we were able to go over some key instructions on distance learning, uh, key resources, successes from other states, uh, imp imp uh, roadblocks from other states, uh, but importantly, making sure that we got the resources to them, and already that work is starting to launch in other districts. And as for nutrition, uh, we really commend our operations team at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction uh, for coming up with innovative solutions that we will again bring to the working group established uh, by the governor today. Uh, for example, using the yellow buses to deliver meals potentially, potentially uh, with the guidance of health and human services, keeping certain schools open where students and parents can come get meals. I'll have to turn that to Dr. Cohen. Yeah, so that the case in it is a Wake County uh, school teacher, and the, currently the Wake County Public Health Department is doing um, the contact tracing and finding out all of the details related to that. So we don't have any more details at this time. They're doing that work. Thank you. Yes. We do not. We do not. Yes. Can can you get the mic, please? Sorry. Did the COVID test for the teacher play a role in your decision to cancel school? And if a teacher tested positive, do you think you waited too long to call off? It it did not play a role in our decision to cancel school statewide. I do think that the fact we have not had community spread here in North Carolina is, is a good thing. And the longer we can continue that trend, it means we are flattening the curve. I think that's been circulating on social media where we want to slow down the spread of the infection. And I think the governor's leadership in taking some of these uh, significant steps to limit mass gatherings and now to close schools as we evaluate the speed of which the virus will spread, I think are the appropriate steps coupled with the social distancing that I mentioned, the washing of your hands, um, and doing all of the appropriate wiping down of surfaces. All of these things are helping us here in North Carolina. I do expect to see more cases. Um, we are acting as if community spread is here, even though it isn't, so that we can slow the spread of the virus as, as soon as possible. Um, so those are the steps we're taking, and I think we have put North Carolina 
on firm footing for being able to get ahead of, of this spread. We will continue to watch the numbers um, and, and do our work, but I think we're taking the right steps forward. Thank you. I do, and that is why I specifically went out of my way to mention that this has been a bipartisan effort. I do thank the governor and his team, uh, and I am even working with the State Board of Education. Uh, so we are all working together, and hopefully we all get through this together, and we can get back to the political uh, differences and uh, this and that when we all get through this together. I will point to the hurricanes that have affected North Carolina in the past years. Uh, that is a time where we have all come together and put aside our differences for what's best for our communities. Uh, with the help of the governor and the Republican leadership in the General Assembly, hundreds of millions of dollars to Eastern North Carolina, in addition to federal aid and insurance, has been made available. And that is because uh, the governor and the leaders of the Republican-led General Assembly have worked together. Yes, we have been in contact with them just as much as with the governor's office, and I know the governor's office has been in contact with them. Importantly, what's going to happen is we are going to need to stay strong through this moment. I have instructed superintendents, do what is best for your students, for your teachers, and for families right now, and let us worry about the legislative repercussions later, like the hurricanes. Do what's best for your students, and we will come back and worry about the funding and the calendar flexibility, the testing waivers. None of that's important right now. Right now, what's most important is the health of our state. Thank you. So obviously those tests are not spread to all of the counties because um, we are focusing on, on folks in particular where we're seeing those first few cases. We are making sure to do the contact tracing with our local public health departments. A number of our new positives have come from those, those contacts, so we want to make sure that our, our testing is concentrated in areas um, where we already see the virus, but not alone, which is why earlier this week we have in increased the criteria so that it's anyone in the state of North Carolina who has fever, cough, and is negative for the flu can get access to the testing. Again, we were limited um, uh, in, in the testing uh, supplies that we needed at the lab. Um, we've done incredible work and our team has been working night and day to increase capacity, not only at our state lab, but I know our lab partners in the private sector, like LabCorp, our, our academic partners, whether they're at Atrium um, or at Duke or at other places where they're testing, they've been working night and day to get up testing. So I feel like our testing capacity is, is coming up. Now, I still say that there are supply chain concerns um, related to that, but right now we feel like we are getting into a place where folks are, are getting access to the test in addition, we're working, as I said, to some of those community site alternatives for folks to be able to um, access tests. So, as I said, rapidly evolving, always some new information every day. So stay tuned for more guidance, whether it's guidance to our primary care doctors um, or to the community about opportunities for, for testing uh, closer to them. Thank you. I will add to that that testing is a priority for our administration and the numbers that Dr. Cohen gave you, we believe that they are greater than that because there are labs performing these tests that are not reporting negatives to us. They have to report positives to us. But the, I have instructed 
uh, this team behind us here to go to all of these labs so that we can gather all of this information regarding how many tests are being performed. We want to know that number as well as the positives, and they're going to work to get that information up so that we what we know. The good things is that uh, more and more labs are beginning to test, and we're going to continue to work to increase capacity. And I think even at the federal level, they have begun to realize that this is a real problem that has been caused by the lack of supplies from the CDC. And we're all in this thing together, and we gotta, we've got to fix it. Yes? Uh, how are the school closures going to impact things like paying for teachers and other school employees, teacher leave, all those kinds of things? Well, the emergency order gives us a lot of flexibility. We will work closely with the Department of Public Instruction, with the State Board of Education uh, to figure all those things out because we are in uncharted territory here with these statewide closures and with this pandemic not knowing how this is affecting our entire population. So what we have to do is to be ready to make quick, tough decisions, but also be ready to modify those decisions if we see other issues that would make us do something different or something more or lessen a restriction. And we, we are working on this night and day, making sure that the health and welfare of the people of North Carolina is our number one priority. And we're going to continue to do that every day until we get through this. And as North Carolinians together, we will. Thank you all very much. Oh, yes, yes. Teachers will still get. Uh, absolutely, yes. Thank you.